Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks, his website RickAckerman.com. Welcome back to the show, Rick. It's always a pleasure, Jim. Thanks for inviting me on. Rick, the stock market's not your favorite place to be right now. How come? Well, I usually defer to my charts, Jim. They've kept me honest over the years. And uh, this time I happen to have some so-so buy signals in a lot of what I call the lunatic stocks, the uh, FANG stocks that institutional buyers simply throw other people's hard-earned money at. Uh, but at this point, I'm tending to ignore buy signals in the uh, NASDAQ E-mini futures. And... Uh, I'm looking at, uh, well, much lower prices. Uh, it could go either way, and I think we're getting a break on these fangs lower. Uh, I just think the market's running up against certain realities that uh, will thwart even the this uh, long-standing 10-year habit of throwing money at stocks. I wonder, are we going to see, everybody keeps predicting, oh, someday there will be a crash, of course, but... We had that 20% correction after Christmas. Could we see another 20% correction and then everybody jump right back in again with both feet? Now, I think, I think this is it really. Uh, I would say the market's seen its highs and I've said that before and I'm willing to, uh, uh, keep an open mind, but I'd have to see pretty strong evidence, meaning some rallies that get by some important prior peaks. And in the case of the the, uh, the major averages, the uh, Dow and the S and P's, you'd need to be uh, pushing up to new all time highs. So I used to think that was possible. I I wasn't going to turn much more bullish at new record highs, but uh, just more cautious. So uh, I I think we're going to see, uh, you know, the rallies will be distributive, and um, that huge rally we had from December's lows was enough to keep a lot of the bears out of the way, but I think they're going to recover their mojo and you're going to see more selling pressure from them. What's keeping the market at its uh, current levels? Well, it's kind of a, uh, it's an irresistible force meets the immovable object kind of thing. Uh, the market has strong support from all of the wrong places. One is companies buying back their own shares, and that's happened to the tune of literally trillions of dollars. That's a lot of money. It only takes a few billion to buy uh, a nice rally on a given day. And uh, we've had an enormous sum that is has been put into the market by companies. Some of them uh, have cash hoards of $30 or billion dollars or more, and yet it's been so cheap for them to borrow money that they borrow money to buy up the, the pre, buy up their own shares, and that has the effect of uh, of uh, bringing the uh, raising the price earnings multiple because there are fewer shares in circulation. So that's been a, a very powerful support of the market. And then you have the uh, habitual throwing of other people's hard earned money at stocks from our institutional buyers. And uh, even in cases like Boeing, where you've got a full-blown scandal going, uh, they seem to have enough money to prop stops, stocks like that. But I think uh, they've, they've sort of, the boys have kind of reached their limit there. Uh-huh. Well, uh, there are now so many lawsuits uh, Boeing's facing over its uh, 737 MAX. Plus, they haven't solved the problem yet to the satisfaction of aviation authorities around the planet. Yeah, and when you see the, um, well, they had an $80 billion settlement against Monsanto, which is owned by Bayer. That's just one case that was decided in California. In this case, uh, the, just from the news that's been out so far, Boeing is very culpable for two crashes that killed, I think it was 362 people. 
So uh, Boeing is kind of a, it's a national treasure. It's too big to fail. And uh, But if you look at these uh, the, the stock's buoyancy as distribution, you run up against the problem of uh, who do these huge holders of Boeing shares distribute to, and not grandma and grandpa. So uh, Boeing's going to have to come down quite a bit from the current 347 per share. Is it possible for Boeing to go bankrupt because of this? I don't think so. I think it, 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 Boeing is so such a key piece of America's manufacturing sector that it will continue to produce. But uh, we had a two-month period there where there were zero orders for the 737 MAX that was involved in those two fatal collisions, and that hasn't happened in seven years. So, And, and there are now going to be additional delays. The uh, regulators are being very careful at this point about letting a lot of uh, 737s loose that are not mothball, but, the, the, you know, some of the airlines have retired their fleet. Southwest went the other way, uh, full bore, and said, hey, we're going to be doing nothing but buying 737 MAX, and I think they probably hitched their wagon to the wrong star there. So the, Boeing has real problems, and it is a key stock in, in the bull market. I was also going to say it's a huge defense contractor, so you can't let the, the big builder of your bombers and fighters disappear. Uh, for sure, but 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 you know they've got a lot of problems. Uh, it's it's hard to gauge what the what the lawsuits will amount to. It's going to be a big number, but also uh, as was predictable a couple week uh, months ago, even when institutions were still throwing money at Boeing, uh, we would start to see order cancellations come in, or at least so far a dearth of of new orders. We'll have more with Rick Ackerman right after the break. Cypress Development Corp's flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. Rick, is it a good idea to bring in your initial public offering into a market that apparently has peaked? Yeah, and it's worse than that. You know, we've had, we've got kind of a hat trick going with the first two rounds. Lyft and Uber have laid an egg, even though you got to give the, the sleazeballs that work these markets credit for uh, bringing Lyft and Uber back a little bit since their IPOs. Uh, both fell flat relative to expectations, and to complete the hat trick, we've got an IPO coming on WeWork, which, depending on on what kind of accounting principles you use, is either uh, I, I won't call it a hoax, but I'll tell you when they were originally talking about a forty billion dollar valuation for WeWork, uh, a lot of uh, investors who can read the numbers were shaking their heads. So, um, uh, a twenty billion dollar valuation, I should say. So, um, you know, WeWork has used uh, the same sort of fancy figures that Uber and Lyft do to suggest that maybe someday they'll make money. But uh, when WeWork goes down, uh, when the IPO lays an egg, I think it's going to be impossible to re- rally these, uh, these FANG stocks. And they've got their own problems because Facebook is under intense regulatory heat right now uh, just because of the way they've trampled... Uh, privacy rights and uh, apple has uh its sales for its 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 big money maker the uh, iphone have been weakening not only here but in the second largest market in china and apple's ridiculous answer to uh boost revenues is to jump into the streaming content business where there's so many big powerful players that we wind up having more television great tv than we have time to watch and um uh, you know, and Google is having 
Well, it's hard to speak of Google's problems because they've got their hands in so many things, and one of those things is uh, the uh, just the uh, cloud services business, which is supposedly a multi-trillion dollar industry that uh, there's enough there to grab to keep revenues flowing more or less forever. Well, I saw where they said the computer of the future. You have a keyboard. You don't have any uh, CPU capacity at all at home. You have to use these services. But we've seen so many uh, sky or cloud services hacked. Why would you trust your personal information in their hands? Well, I think it, you, you do it probably for the same reason that I've, I've I used to really hate Microsoft for the same reasons that everyone else does, but they've gone to a model of cloud-based services, and I have to say that uh, the Office 365 suite has worked well for me, and the best thing about it is that Microsoft actually supports it. I've had uh, tech calls lasting longer than two hours to resolve certain issues, but they're there with it every step of the way. So the cloud-based model for whatever security problems it brings is uh, has that offset of good service, and you don't have to keep updating. The updates are automatic. We'll have more with Rick Ackerman right after this. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. Rick, are they having industrial problems in Japan? Well, Japan is a little bit skittish about the uh, the trade war between China and the U.S., and it seems like even if we get some sort of uh, Trumpian deal, we're still going to be at war with them. Nobody expects much of a deal at this point, least of all Japan. So I'm reading that uh, that orders for heavy machinery are, are, de- are, are uh, weakening in Japan, and uh, I think that's probably too true globally. No one's really quite sure about putting huge new sums into things that would essentially grow uh, grow capacity. So um, uh, so there's a real problem with the uh, the trade talks. And even though at one point I, I wrote that we should sell the rumor and buy the news, meaning when some trade deal comes, no matter how bad it is, you've got to buy the market. But since then, a number of other things are are, are coming to bear on stocks so that the we can live with the bad deal that might come with China becomes a little bit uh, more, uh, a bit, uh, even less satisfying. And, of course, one of those things was we had uh, durable goods orders down 2.1% for April, uh, which would be attributable in some significant part to Boeing, but attributable nonetheless. So we, we've got a lot of things going on. Uh, counterbalanced by this absurd idea that, uh, and, and this is all you read in the press about the 3.6% or whatever it is in a given month unemployment. I say big deal. Um, you know, a lot of it is McJobs and, uh, it, 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 whatever the unemployment rate, it hasn't even had a microscopic effect on the debt bubble that's going to do us in. So, uh, you know, more people are, are working perhaps or there are fewer unemployed. But they're still uh, they're still buried under debt. Is it true something like seventy percent of Americans still haven't recovered from the two thousand and eight crash? Well, that's uh, I'm, I I kind of believe the seventy percent part. Although uh, <clears throat> there's kind of a gray area there as to what constitutes recovery. But I know for all the uh, the hullabaloo, the hubris in the Wall Street Journal about this fabulous recovery we're having. Uh, it's it's similar to the boost we had when when Reagan was president that came ma- mainly from credit stimulus. Um, you know we've got 
there's there's so many big things going on that seem more significant than asset inflation. Uh, for one, we're we've uh, we're going to have to uh, convert all of our retail space to something else. Who knows what? Because now uh, all of the big department stores, the chain operators, are showing real weakness. They they had a blip for one quarter and everybody thought oh great maybe they're not going to die but they will and even Nordstrom's I think was off nine percent on their last uh, earnings and um, and Kohl's and all these companies that compete really hard are sinking so that's a huge thing really it's creative destruction of of the f- first magnitude when you talk about somehow dealing with all the uh, the, the 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 death of brick and mortar retail in this con- country and of course, we've got the real estate so pumped up now that uh, that's another thing that we're going to have to reckon with. So this is all what I would categorize as deflationary overhang, and it's uh, it's about to come roaring back. And and for all the the bull that the Fed wants to feed us about fear of inflation, the real fear is of deflation. And the Fed certainly has no excuse to tighten now because inflation is tame. Why is inflation tame? Because we're feeling the incipient power of, of a deflation that's a uh, that's hundred times as big as anything the central banks could throw at it by way of monetization. Do you see anything big happening with gold near term? No, I think gold's best shot is, is, is a feeble rally that happens simply because the stock market is getting absolutely obliterated. Um, you know, gold will have... Uh, it's going to have difficulty. Any company that mines gold has huge energy energy cost to factor and um, labor costs. And I don't see the mining stocks really taking off or gold for that matter. Uh, if we had perceptions that uh, a recession is turning into something worse, uh, and by worse I mean like really worse where we're uh, contemplating a possible barter economy with the financial system more or less shut down, then yes, gold might have a, uh, a resurgence. Mm-hmm. Now, Bitcoin almost disappeared, then had a huge resurgence. Now, Switzerland is looking at a way to try to combine cryptocurrency and gold. Is that the wave of the future for gold? I can't believe the Swiss, Swiss would be talking such nonsense, really. They're usually pretty smart about uh, the, the financial markets and, and especially what constitutes money, and um, uh, but I, I can't, it's hard to figure this this lunatic leap that, that Bitcoin has taken uh, really from out of the crypt. Uh, I think it's because a couple of big players, uh, legitimate legitimate financial institutions, have said things to the effect that there's customer there's customer demand for blockchain currency. And, uh, but to me, that doesn't counteract e- even slightly the, the things we've read about Bitcoin over the last year and a half or so, where a lot of Bitcoin banks have gotten hacked. I think the most recent theft within the last few months involved $60 million that just kind of disappeared. So there, there's actually, for all the talk about how secure cryptocurrencies are, they are, uh, they're hackable. And uh, I don't doubt the banks eventually can get a handle on blockchain algorithms to make it more secure, but it, it still feels to me like Bitcoin has to be uh, reinvented for it to make a legitimate comeback. What do you see happening with interest rates? Well, I've had, uh, for, for years now, I've just been forecasting lower rates, and uh, this is part of my deflationary mindset or deflationist mindset, and uh, I've had a target of 2.11 on the the 10-year note. We're currently at, uh, looks like 2.23, so we've got a ways to go, but I don't expect whatever bounce we get from 2.1% to, to last. I, I would say I wouldn't be surprised if the 10-year uh, went down as low as 1.5%, and my long-term forecast is even lower than that. It's closer to zero. So I see dollar strength. And uh, lower lower yields, and uh, I think the place to be really is uh, long term treasuries right now. Rick, thank you so much for chatting with us. Always a pleasure, Jim. Thanks again for having me on. My guest has been Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks. 
His website, rickackerman.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. If you have questions for Rick or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.